Gee, your dad's missing you so much, Shannon. He's even out looking for you. Please come home, Shannon. If you're out there, come home. If anybody's got my daughter, my beautiful princess daughter, please bring her home. This is Karen Matthews' face. Her daughter, Shannon, just nine, has been strangely unheard of for over a week. Last known, she was seen leaving Westmore Junior School at 3.10 p.m. on February 19th, 2008. This Dewsbury-based incident in Yorkshire, England, will embark you on an implausible journey filled with numerous explosive revelations, similar to a mystery novel. How does a schoolgirl vanish unnoticed from the school grounds? The perplexing confusion will soon unfold. We wanted to convey our heartfelt sympathy to all the relatives and acquaintances of Shannon Matthews, who was struck with a grotesque incident that no child in life would ever confront. Speaking of Yorkshire, England, it's a pastoral district nestled between a variety of hills and valleys. Local residents fondly refer to it as God's country. However, the serene town of Dewsbury is on the brink of transforming into a vortex of bustling police activity. Further, it is amidst a media hysteria that was posing to expose the matter to the entire world. The police are forced to react promptly whenever a child's location is unidentified. With each passing moment of not retrieving a child, the likelihood of the child being brought back alive gradually decreases. In just a few hours, West Yorkshire police quickly assembled a team dedicated to finding Shannon Matthews, going door to door and interrogating everyone they encountered. Within a day, over 200 officers from nearby forces joined the Yorkshire police to aid in their search efforts for the missing girl. Numerous worried citizens volunteered their help, and along with the police search teams, they combed through fields and forests nearby in hopes of finding any hint of her location. Regrettably, these devoted endeavors yielded no results. Shannon's mother, Karen, adamantly believed her daughter hadn't gone far. However, despite searching the houses of friends and relatives, Shannon remained missing. The local community who tirelessly dedicated their time to the search was as puzzled as the police. Although it couldn't be said publicly, officers privately grew increasingly concerned. The Shannon had simply strayed and was nearby. Standard police procedures should have located her by now. Clearly, there was far more to the situation than was apparent at first glance. Shannon Matthews was born on September 9, 1998, to parents Leon Rose and Karen Matthews, who had separated while she was still quite young. Often described as a timid and shy child, Shannon found it challenging to interact with other children and usually played alone or with just a handful of close friends. Shannon grew up in a busy family where her mother was primarily responsible for raising her because her father had become less active in her life after the divorce. In total, Karen had seven children with five different men, while five of the children, including Shannon, lived with Karen and her boyfriend, Craig Mahan. The other two resided with their respective fathers. Karen and Craig, though perceived as pleasant individuals, were often the subject of gossip due to their age difference. Craig was 10 years younger than 32-year-old Karen. Additionally, Karen's character was called into question due to having seven children at a relatively young age. Some people even accused her of having multiple children to avoid working and to receive more state benefits. Previously, the UK benefit system was designed in such a way that individuals with more children received more claims. Despite recent changes, Corrine at the time was collecting approximately 400 pounds weekly from the state. This amount was comparable to an average person's wage. Questions were soon raised about Karen's capability as a mother. During an intense altercation with one of her previous partners, concerned friends across the street took it upon themselves to intervene. They crossed the road into Karen's home and forcibly took Shannon from her custody, suspecting that Karen wasn't taking adequate care of her. In an uncharacteristic action, even the police officers who responded to the situation permitted the neighbors to take temporary guardianship of Shannon. Medical professionals examined Shannon and found her bearing marks of neglect, infested with lice, and clearly having gone unbathed for a while. This upbringing might provide some explanation for some of Shannon's characteristics, such as her introversion, hesitation, and habit of getting startled by sudden noises. The neighbors had tried contacting social services numerous times, but to no avail. The day Shannon disappeared, she attended her customary swimming lessons arranged by her school. Her usual return time from school was around 3.30. However, 
Corinne, her mother, was not at home at that time and only became aware of Shannon's absence when her boyfriend, Craig, casually mentioned it. Immediately, Karen reached out to the school to confirm whether the bus from the swimming lessons had returned, and it had indeed. She also sought help from neighbors, inquiring if they had seen Shannon, but unfortunately, no one had. By 6.50 p.m., almost three and a half hours after Shannon was last seen, Karen decided to dial 999, the UK emergency number. In these tight-knit neighborhoods, news travels quickly. Before law enforcement could even respond, residents were braving near freezing temperatures to comb the streets. In no time, a call was put out to all of the U.S. major media, pleading for anyone with information to come forward. While the media can be handy for disseminating public appeals, it can also obstruct ongoing investigations. The news of Shannon's disappearance prompted media teams from across the country to rush to the narrow street where Karen Matthews resided. Within two days, the search for Shannon had ramped up to include 300 officers. The unsettling introduction of the murder squad into the mix offered a potentially troubling glimpse into the police's current state of mind. The local populace was in a frenzy, doing everything in their power under police directive to aid. Law enforcement was visible everywhere, doing all that they could. However, not only locals, but also the two family liaison officers who were assisting Karen Matthews made an observation during that time. Among those attempting to provide assistance, she appeared to be the most composed. It's surprising that a mother who has lost her child would be able to maintain such calmness, yet Karen and her boyfriend managed to do so. In the UK, families in similar situations are typically assigned a single liaison officer, but Karen had two. The first officer, DC, Alex Grumet, found Curran's composure suspicious and requested a second officer for another perspective. DC Christine Freeman joined the case the following day, and she too had her own suspicions. Upon entering the house, Karen's boyfriend was playing his Xbox while Karen sat beside him without any apparent concern. What's worse, when DC Freeman's phone rang with a popular song as the ringtone, Karen didn't ask if there was news about her missing daughter. Instead, she expressed her love for the song and began dancing around the room. These are not the actions of a worried mother. Following her impromptu dance, Karen then voiced her displeasure with the media camped outside her home. She even mentioned that people were comparing her to the McCann family, who had lost their daughter Madeline while on vacation in Portugal. This unusual behavior further raised the officer's suspicions. The authorities maintained their composure and advised her to pay no attention to the press. Despite this, Karen persisted in voicing her displeasure about the perceived insufficient efforts to locate Shannon. Her accusations came across as odd, given that just moments before, she had been joyfully dancing around the room. Detective Constable Freeman expressed disbelief at her accusations of inaction. Considering the deployment of 300 officers and the extensive searches by concerned community members, Karen, on the other hand, was preoccupied with watching her partner play video games. Freeman acknowledged that police often face criticism and speculated that her behavior might be attributed to the shock of the circumstances. Once the officers had departed and Karen's grievance with the media had been aired, her subsequent behavior raised eyebrows. Positioning herself by the window, she proceeded to open and shut the drapes in a repetitive cycle, grinning and gazing in the direction of her television. Karen found amusement in viewing the movement of her own curtains on the news broadcast, sharing her mirth and playful commentary within clear sight of the news cameras. On February 20th, 2008, Karen Matthews finally appeared before the media, pleading for Shannon's return and urging anyone who had her to bring her back immediately. I love you so much, me and your dad and brothers. Your sisters, everybody loves you. Your dad's missing you so much, Shannon. He's even out looking for you. Please come on, Shannon, if you're out there, come home. If anybody's got my daughter, my beautiful princess daughter, please bring her home. It had become evident to everyone involved that Shannon hadn't merely gone to a friend's house without informing anyone. She wasn't going to reappear unexpectedly, humbled, and apologetic. At this point, the case was being treated as a kidnapping. Parents ceased allowing their children to walk to school or play outdoors. With a suspected abductor at large, nobody was willing to take any risks. In response, local businesses and members of the public decided to further support the family. Some individuals established a fund to collect a reward for the police, which could be offered to anyone who provided information leading to Shannon's discovery. 
the campaign successfully managed to amass 50,000 pound due to the immense generosity of the community. It should be mentioned that Dewsbury isn't what most people would consider affluent, and Karen Matthews resided in an area known for its low income. The donors, despite their own financial constraints, were heavily driven by empathy and the desire to aid those in need. Local establishments even began offering food to Karen's household in an attempt to ease their troubles. However, the behavior of Karen and her companion, Craig, left the community bemused and questioning their motives. Their actions almost seemed to scoff at the goodwill offered by the local businesses. One of the local shops offered Karen and Craig the opportunity to do a week's worth of shopping at their expense. True to form, the couple went to the shop and filled their shopping cart, referred to as a trolley in the UK, with foodstuffs. Surprisingly, they proceeded to fill a second trolley entirely with alcohol. This questionable act really begins to put Karen's priorities into perspective. If you were in Karen's shoes, with Shannon as your child who had gone missing, would you be spending your time searching for her, or would you take advantage of kindness and load up on free liquor? Soon after, the authorities requested Karen's presence for questioning. At that juncture, she remained oblivious to their growing suspicion towards her. She was only informed that it was standard procedure to re-examine the case to possibly discover previously overlooked details. As any mother would be, Karen was highly distraught and could not stop crying. We must bring our attention back to Leon, Shannon's father, who we introduced before. Despite his somewhat absent role in her life until then, he had been tirelessly searching for his daughter. He too was summoned for questioning where he cast certain aspersions on the lifestyle within Karen's household. He confided in the authorities that Shannon was quite unhappy at home, and on multiple occasions, she proposed the idea of residing with him. This confirmed the authorities' initial suspicions. In the early stages, the authorities inspected Shannon's room and saw a significant note on the wall next to her bunk bed that read, I want to live with my dad. One thing was becoming apparent. Karen's statements about Shannon's contentment and lack of reasons for fleeing appeared to be untrue. The authorities hypothesized that the message on the bedroom wall might have prompted Shannon to run away. Though her father disagreed with this perspective, he told police that no matter what she wrote, she was a good girl who had good relationships with people and wouldn't like being around any new strange surroundings. He was adamant that he felt she had not run away. Eventually, Shannon's room's message would become public knowledge, though it's unclear how. Perhaps the information was leaked by law enforcement, or maybe Leon, Shannon's father, revealed it himself. This raised questions about Karen among friends and family, largely because her lack of visible worry was unsettling. She remained convinced that Shannon was safe and nearby. It's understandable for a distressed mother to hold out hope, but as time passed, one would expect any parent to confront the possibility that their child may never return. Curran maintained, both in public and private conversations, that Shannon was in a comfortable, secure location. She reiterated this sentiment multiple times. A week went by with no news of Shannon. The police released CCTV footage from her school confirming that she had arrived and left safely. Karen continued to give interviews and press conferences, repeatedly expressing her belief that her daughter was with a familiar person, possibly someone close to the family. It's somewhat peculiar to assume, but not entirely unwarranted. Many times, people who are close to and familiar with us commit crimes. When it comes to children, it's quite rare for them to go off with a stranger, particularly outside of school. Based on statistics, it was more probable that she encountered someone she was acquainted with and had some level of trust in, especially considering her shy nature. With law enforcement's efforts yielding no results, they were unsure of what steps to take next. They opted to speak with Shannon's best friend at school, Megan Aldridge. Megan's words were heartbreaking. I just want my friend back. She is the bestest friend in the world. Her chair is empty at school. I have nobody to sit next to. I sit on my own in the playground with nobody to talk to. She's really kind. I just want my friend back. Megan also disclosed that Shannon had been a victim of bullying at school prior to her disappearance. She had been kicked and labeled as fat and ugly. Children can be incredibly cruel. Fortunately, Megan defended her friend, which led to the bullies stopping their actions. However, Shannon was left understandably hurt and upset. As we know, she faced a difficult home life and now had to cope with being bullied at school as well. Megan recounted how Shannon used to escape to a hidden spot behind a bush near the train tracks. 
Even though Megan couldn't exactly pinpoint the location of the police, her input was far from useless. She provided a candid depiction of Shannon's circumstances and mindset. The young girl was under the torment of bullying, unhappy at home, and found solace only in Megan's company, painting a heartbreaking picture of a nine-year-old's life. It revealed that Karen, Shannon's mother, may not have been telling the truth when she gave her account. Shannon's discontentment provided a plausible reason for her to run away. Based on this, the police concluded the search was likely a recovery operation rather than a rescue mission. They, therefore, enlisted the help of 16 recovery dogs. Considering there were only 27 such dogs across all UK police forces at that point, the magnitude of the operation was significant. It's important to note that these dogs differ from search and rescue dogs. These trained dogs have been conditioned to seek out deceased bodies. In addition to these dogs, there were still more than 300 officers on the hunt, as well as hundreds of community members volunteering their help. Despite access to all these resources, the police were unable to break the case. Dewsbury isn't that large. It is, in fact, quite a quaint town. The police were aware of Shannon's introverted nature and were certain that she wouldn't wander off into unfamiliar areas. However, every inch of content land had been searched and then searched and then searched again. It was baffling where she could have disappeared. Speculation started spreading about Karen's boyfriend, Craig, and these weren't mere unsustained theories born out of sloppy journalism. An unidentified informant claimed to the press that Craig had been abusive towards Shannon before, even hitting her hard enough to leave bruises. Naturally, Craig repudiated these accusations. However, even the local citizens, who had previously supported the family wholeheartedly, were beginning to raise eyebrows. Some from Karen's own family had even started distancing themselves. Intriguingly, during an interview, Craig began to reject the idea that he had any participation in her disappearance. However, what added to the suspicion was the fact that nobody had asked him about his involvement. Could this be a sign of his guilty conscience? Fast forward to March 13, 2008. By this time, Shannon had been missing for more than three weeks. The relentless police investigation was being conducted by a wide range of officers, stemming from West Yorkshire Police, Lancashire Police, and Greater Manchester Police. Everyone was mobilized in the urgent quest, though the possibility of locating Shannon alive was dwindling. Regardless, they remained steadfast in their resolve to solve the case. Then, in a twist of fate, they were provided with a fresh lead to explore on the same day. A relative of Karen introduced a previously unknown name, Michael Donovan. Interestingly, Donovan was not an outsider. He was related to Karen's boyfriend, Craig, and resided just shy of a mile from Karen and Craig's dwelling. This information piqued the interest of the officers for two significant reasons. First, despite Shannon's mysterious disappearance, Donovan had maintained an eerily low presence, not making a single offer to aid in the search. This was odd behavior that hadn't gone unnoticed by the family. Then the second red flag came when Karen was instructed to compile a familial chart for the law enforcement team. The aim was to expand the investigation to all family members, looking to interview them and search their residences. However, Karen had oddly chosen to omit Donovan from the family tree. This could have been a random oversight or an intentional omission. The truth remained to be discovered. By March 13, police had collected over 1,000 statements, searched more than 1,700 homes, and conducted formal interviews with over 200 individuals, including Karen Matthews' friends, family, and ex-partners. However, Michael Donovan had not been interviewed, as his existence seemed to be concealed from the authorities. With no other leads, the police focused their efforts on investigating Michael. Being cautious not to scare him into fleeing, they first conducted research on his background. Surprisingly, it turned out that Michael had previously kidnapped his own daughter from her school just 15 months earlier. He had a total of two daughters, and the state placed both of them in foster care because Michael was unable to see them. This decision was made due to allegations that he forced the children to witness him engaging in sexual acts with two escorts. Upon uncovering this information, the police promptly went to Michael's residence Despite receiving no response when knocking on the door, a neighbor approached and informed the officers that they had heard the sound of footsteps inside the house, seemingly coming from at least two people. At this point, the police were determined not to waste any more time. Without a moment's pause or forewarning, the police burst through Michael's doorway and commenced their search of the premises. At first glance, it appeared deserted. However, 
the silence was shattered by the faint cries of a young girl pleading for the commotion to cease, claiming it was scaring her. The source of her voice was elusive to the officers until they explored a bedroom and, much to their astonishment and solace, found Shannon hiding beneath the bed, her voice becoming clear. An officer gently lifted her and escorted her out of the residence, later expressing overwhelming relief and emotion at discovering her alive. While ensuring Shannon's well-billing, the officer inquired about Michael's whereabouts. Shannon indicated he was also under the bed. Swiftly returning to the bedroom, the officers found Michael playing possum, hoping to avoid detection, resisting arrest fiercely. He assaulted the officers with punches, kicks, and even a bite. Amidst the struggle, he demanded Karen be brought to him, confessing their scheme to split a sum of 50000 Despite his violence, Michael was apprehended as the search continued. Among their findings was a bed with a rope, securely fastened, which had been used to restrain Shannon from escaping. The investigators discovered a set of guidelines that had been imposed on Shannon. She was instructed not to approach the windows, not to run around, and not to touch or do anything unless supervised. Shannon narrated her ordeal of being physically confined with a rope tied around her waist. Although this allowed some minor mobility, such as going to the bathroom, it certainly didn't allow her much liberty or a chance to escape. Essentially, she was kept captive, almost like a pet, throughout this horrifying incident. It was heartbreaking to hear that her own gen, including her supposed mother, had held her captive, all for the sake of money, which was raised by the compassionate local community. Upon reaching the police station, a man named Michael was processed. When asked if he wished to comment, his answer was a firm directive to arrest Karen. Yes, you will arrest Karen. This incident culminated on March 15, 2008, when Michael was officially interviewed at the police station. A statement was read out by his attorney on his behalf. She said I was to keep Shannon and look after her and she, Karen, would report her missing. I said, what do I do then? She said, you'll take her back to your place and keep her there until I phone you. I said I wasn't happy about this and she then threatened, if I didn't do it, to get three lads onto me. Michael Donovan's three-page statement was read to detectives by his solicitor. And I was frightened that if I didn't do it, they would come after me. I said, OK, I'll do it. And she said there was money for me in it. I said I didn't want the money. She told me just to do what she said. She said if I told anyone or I went to anyone, I would be dead. The course of action was outlined for Michael to locate Shannon at a time that Karen considered suitable. Karen might not have been the most clever, or perhaps she hadn't thought about how the situation would spiral out of control. It was almost inconceivable to think that Shannon would be located by a relative just a mile from their house after hundreds of police officers and community members had conducted numerous thorough searches. Simply put, it wasn't plausible. Karen was under the impression that once Shannon was found, the 50,000 pound reward would directly be given to her without any further scrutiny. Once more, she was mistaken. Before rewarding any money, an investigation would certainly be initiated and her trafficking plot would be unveiled. Michael faced charges of kidnapping, unlawful detention, and interfering with the course of justice. On March 18, Karen was brought to the police station for interrogation. She rejected any allegations of her involvement in the kidnapping and even denied any knowledge of Michael's residence. Although she accused him of falsifying all the charges, the officials remained skeptical. Listen, Kat, I know you're upset, and we need to be able to establish exactly what's going on. And you are aware that Michael is in part holding you partly responsible. So I think the best thing we can do is so that we're all clear about this, is tell you what Michael's saying. And he's lying to me, Nick, I want you to know that he didn't know where he lived at all. Never speak to him about anything about abducting Shannon at all. It was just a normal day for us that she went to school and come home from school, that was it. In a surprising development, Craig, Karen's significant other, was arrested on April 2nd for 11 charges related to child pedophilia. Law enforcement had thoroughly searched their residence and all personal devices. They discovered Craig had kept 49 distinct images featuring victims as young as four years old. This, shockingly, was even younger than nine-year-old Shannon. The charges against Craig were quickly brought and he was swiftly sentenced. However, 
the sentence was a mere 20 weeks in prison. This was all completely separate from the investigation into Shannon Matthews. A few days later, Karen Matthews was apprehended on April 6, 2008. While being transported to the police station, she finally gave up her pretense and admitted to knowing Shannon's whereabouts the entire time. Nonetheless, she still attempted to deny any accountability. Upon formal booking, Curran denied any knowledge of Shannon's abduction. She confessed to requesting Michael's help in keeping Shannon safe, claiming it was only due to her desire to distance herself from Craig. In her own words, she stated, as far as I'm concerned, Michael abducted her independently. I had nothing to do with it. Yeah. Was it uh, the if Karen truly intended to escape Craig's influence, what prompted her to dispatch Shannon to the residence of Craig's uncle, a man whose reputation was tainted by mild allegations of inappropriate conduct around minors. Furthermore, why was Shannon the only child sent there? Karen's assertions were puzzling. Despite the scrutiny, she maintained her narrative about needing to distance herself from Craig, showing no signs of altering her account. However, Curran's fabrications didn't get her very far. Shannon was subsequently taken into protective custody and received a medical examination, which would disclose the full scope of maltreatment she endured. Upon examination, Shannon was found to have ingested travel ease, a medication for motion sickness that induces sleepiness, and tamazopam, a potent analgesic that can lead to nausea and a euphoric state in adults, suggesting an even greater impact on a nine-year-old child. It became evident that Shannon's own kin had been medicating her. Moreover, the drugging wasn't isolated to the incident of her kidnapping. Analysis indicated that she had been regularly fed these powerful drugs for as long as 20 months preceding her abduction. The court proceedings involving Karen Matthews and Michael Donovan began on November 11, 2008. The trial wrapped up less than a month later, on December 4, 2008. Throughout the case, Karen assigned blame to her boyfriend, Craig, claiming she participated in the plot out of fear. However, her explanations did not earn her any sympathy from the judge, the jury, or the prosecution. Julian Goose QC, the Queen's counsel, accused her of constant deception throughout the investigation. During the case, Karen made a show of her emotions, shedding continuous tears. There was testimony from several police officers who detailed the drugs discovered in Shannon's body and the neglect she had endured in her short life. The prosecution highlighted the substantial resources that had been allocated from across the nation for the search for Shannon, who wasn't really missing. The expenses involved in the investigation had cost the UK's taxpayers over three and a half million pounds. These resources, had they not been directed towards Dewsbury, could have been employed in addressing other genuine crimes occurring in other locations. Matthews and Donovan received a guilty verdict on December 4 for crimes of kidnapping, false imprisonment, and perverting the justice system. They were sentenced to eight years of imprisonment on 23rd January, 2009. Despite the seriousness of their crimes, the lenient British legal system allowed their release after serving only half their sentence due to good behavior. The case exposed the shocking extent to which some individuals would go to amass a small fortune, even at the expense of exploiting their offspring. Shannon and her siblings had a life marked by neglect from their mother and her successive boyfriends. The media labeled Karen Matthews as the worst mother in Britain, a title she refuted, stating that she was not a murderer. In a turn of events, Karen undertook parenting lessons while serving her prison sentence, a classic case of closing the barn door after the horses fled. She stated that she was doing it just in case she had more children in the future. Prison life was challenging for Karen, who faced multiple physical confrontations with other inmates, leading to her isolation from the general population. During a radio interview after her release, she revealed that the two things she missed most about life outside prison were sex and shopping, not once mentioning her kids. Following her prison release, Karen was reportedly relocated to the southern part of the UK, away from Dewsbury, and was rumored to have converted to Christianity. The last media interaction had her drop her false persona as her quest to find employment proved futile. Voicing her dissatisfaction with the inadequate public aid, she portrayed herself as a perpetual victim. There was no sign of introspection or change in this self-consumed, regrettable woman. The current locations of Matthew and Donovan are yet to be confirmed. 
it's undeniable that had they stayed in Dewsbury, their community would have shunned them. Dewsbury was a community that went above and beyond because it was home to real, diligent, lower income people. They even went to the extent of sacrificing their very limited savings to search for a young girl, a cherished member of their community. Craig Mahan was released from prison before Karen's trial concluded. He was relocated to Keithley, a quaint rural village in Yorkshire. His newfound peace was short-lived as the locals recognized him and lashed out. Thereafter, authorities have had to move him multiple times as his notoriety precedes him wherever he goes. While law enforcement could consider moving him out of Yorkshire, perhaps they believe it is more appropriate for him to live a life of constant fear and paranoia. This is fitting retribution for his comparatively mild sentence of 20 weeks in prison. Following the unfortunate incidents, Shannon and her siblings found themselves segregated. Some were accommodated with other relatives, while Shannon was taken to a foster family that offered her the affection and care she deserved from the start. Shannon was bestowed with a fresh identity, disconnecting her from her past grievances. In the aftermath of her traumatic experiences, she suffered from constant nightmares and underwent therapy to revert back to her original self. Today, as an adult, she leads an ordinary life surrounded by her family, distancing herself from her past nightmares. The Matthews family residence remains boarded up as a melancholic symbol of the events that occurred there. This representation of a vile woman's manipulation that brought the global media to their doorsteps had the local community and police on relentless searches, all while being aware of the con to fill her pockets at her daughter's expense. The local community still has not changed and remains as closely connected as before. It is certainly a better place without the presence of Karen Matthews, Craig Meehan, and Michael Donovan. Our best wishes go to all the friends and families impacted by this case, especially Shannon Matthews, who is deserving of all the blessings life has to offer her.